Welcome to the second screencast in this series of a baker's dozen of common mathematics mistakes. In this screencast we'll be looking at the general heading of making sure you use the right techniques and rules in your algebraic and numerical manipulation. There are four things we'll look at starting with the mixing up of the rules for dealing with fractions how you can learn to use the index rules correctly, what happens if you use some leaps of logic to make up your own rules which may or may not work, and finally what happens when you're cancelling items from the top and bottom of fractions. Let's start with what happens if we mix up our rules for manipulating fractions. Here's a simple numerical activity two-thirds plus three-fifths. Now if you're unsure about the relationship between what you do with addition in fractions and what you do when you're multiplying fractions you might be tempted to apply a rule that says add the top lines together and divide by the addition of the bottom lines which would produce the answer five-eighths. Now this isn't true. This is actually the kind of thing you do when you're multiplying or dividing fractions. And as always, we need to be able to fix our own mistakes or have strategies that will allow us to detect when we're making an error. In this case, probably the easiest thing to do is ask ourselves, since we're dealing with two actual numerical fractions, does our answer look like the sort of answer we should get from the addition of those two fractions? Have a think for a moment about two-thirds and three-fifths and how they relate to that final answer. Now, maybe you spotted the same thing that I did. Two-thirds is a number that's bigger than a half. Three-fifths is also a number that's bigger than a half of a full unit. Therefore, if we add those two numbers together, we should get an answer that's bigger than one. But as you can see, we've also got an answer that's smaller than one, five-eighths. So a simple little bit of reality checking is going to go a long way. That tells us that our answer is probably wrong just from the logic of what's happened. The correct way of course to add two fractions together is to arrange it so that the denominators, the bottom lines of those fractions, are the same. So if we multiply the first fraction top and bottom line by 5, second fraction top and bottom line by 3, we've recast both those fractions in equivalent form as being parts of 15. Now if we have 10 parts out of 15 plus 9 parts out of 15, that's a grand total of 19 parts out of 15. And that's achieved by simply adding the top lines together over that common bottom line. And as you can see, that answer is indeed a number that's larger than 1, 1 and 4 fifths. Similar things can happen when we work with the rules for indices. There's about 6 or 7 rules that are listed in your usual algebra textbooks that apply when you're working with indexes and it's very easy to get those rules mixed up because they have fairly similar features. Let's look at an example. Here we have an algebraic variable x raised to the 4 multiplied by x raised to 5. Now we know that there are rules that allow us to combine that into a single term, a single base x and applied the appropriate power. Often the difficulty is telling the difference between situations where you multiply the powers together and where you add them. Now on this occasion if you decide that you need to multiply the powers together and therefore the answer is x to the power 20, you'd be wrong. Now the thing about rules in algebra is that they're shortcuts. They're ways of avoiding taking three or four steps to do the same routine job. But there's no point in using a rule if you can't get it right. So the strategy in this case is really to fall back on the two or three extra steps that are needed to establish the rule. And very quickly if you do that you'll find that the rule will start to stick. So the way to handle this one is to go back to first principles. x raised to the 4 multiplied by x to the 5, well 
x to the 4 is telling us that that's x multiplied by itself four times. Similarly with x to the 5, that's x multiplied by itself five times. And you can fairly quickly see that that's really just a sequence of x's of which there are nine being multiplied together or reconverting to an index, x to the 9. And at that point you can see you've confidently got the correct simplification of that original expression and it was achieved by adding the powers together. Here's another common situation that needs simplifying in an algebraic setting. x raised to the 2 or raised to the power 3. What do I do this time? Do I add the powers? Do I multiply the powers? I'm not sure. Let's add them and see what happens. Nope, that's a mistake. So how do you get around that one? Well, it's worth recognising that the brackets are telling us that x squared is the item being raised to the power of 3. And this goes back to something we saw in the first screencast in this series. So if you're taking x squared and raising it to the power of 3, that means you're multiplying it by itself three times. And if you need to, you can even break up those x squareds into individual x's. And very quickly you see that it's a sequence of the variable x multiplied by itself six times, or x to the six. And comparing that to the original statement of the situation, that was achieved by the shortcut rule of multiplying the powers together. You'll probably only need to go back to first principles a couple of times before you've got those basic index rules, those shortcuts, committed to memory quite nicely. Here's a little exercise to see if you've cottoned on to those ideas sufficiently. If you like, have a go at those problems to see whether the right hand sides are correct. Pause the screencast and check your answers when you're done. So here are the answers. Often when I'm working with students I find that they have made up their own rules essentially or developed new rules based on things they already know about other rules. And sometimes when you do this there's no logical backing to the new rule and it doesn't actually work. Here's a classic example. Going back to the addition of fractions, we know that a over c plus b over c, in other words situations where the denominators of the two fractions are the same, are simplified by adding the top lines together over that common bottom line. Thinking of that the other way around, you can split up a single fraction into two fractions by reversing that rule if you wish. I've seen some people who attempted to think the same applies to a situation like that, where I've got two items added together on the bottom line of the fraction. Does the same apply? Is it a over b plus a over c? The answer is no, it isn't. It's very easy to come up with your own versions of rules based on rules you know that do work, but how do you convince yourself that a, a proposed rule doesn't work? Well, the first thing to say about this is that we're dealing with algebra, and the letters a, b, and c stand for arbitrary numbers. And what we're claiming, if we claim that two sides of an algebraic equation are the same, is that replacing those letters by numbers will always, as long as the numbers are sensible numbers, produce an equality between the two sides. So if you've got yourself a little rule that you think might work, a good trick is to come up with arbitrary but fairly simple numbers for a, b, and c and see if they work. So let's have a look. The simplest thing we could try here would be to make a, b, and c all equal to 1. So everywhere you see an a, a b, or a c in the left-hand side of your proposed rule, you replace that by the number 1, and that produces a half. Put the same numbers into the right-hand side, so a over b plus a over c. If they're all made equal to 1, we end up with 1 plus 1, or 2. So you can see for a random choice of simple numbers, the proposed rule, the proposed formula, simply doesn't work. Now sometimes it might work, but it's got to work for all sensible choices of A, B and C. 
And by sensible choices, of course, I mean that B and C, for example, cannot be allowed to equal zero, because as we saw in the first screencast, division by zero is not defined. One of the most common mistakes I see people make, especially when they're working in a hurry on a complex algebraic problem, is that they make mistakes with the cancelling out of items from the top and bottom line of fractions. So here's a simple example here. I've got 2x plus 3 divided by x. Often what people will do is say, oh look, there's an x in the top line and an x in the bottom line. I'll cancel those out, cancel them down to 1, which means that my answer is 5. I've simplified the expression 2x plus 3 divided by x to the number 5. Once again, if you were to check that with appropriate choices of x, you would very quickly find that in almost all cases, the number you replaced x with would lead to something other than 5. Now, as it happens, if you were to choose x equal to 1, then you would indeed get 2 times 1 plus 3 over 1 is 5. So it does work for x equals 1, but it's supposed to work for all sensible values of x. So I could perhaps make x equal to 2, and you would get a totally different answer. So clearly that cancelling exercise is illegal, it hasn't worked. And the question is why? How do you stop yourself doing that? Well, it really hinges on the fact that when we say cancel or cancel out, we're shorthanding a statement that actually is much longer. That's the full statement. Cancel out common factors of the top and bottom lines. Key word here being factors. You'll notice in the expression above that the 2x plus 3, the expression on the top line, does not have x as a factor. In other words, I can't rewrite 2x plus 3 very easily as x times something else. That would make it a factor of the top line. Let's look at an example where factorization helps. Here we've got 2x plus 5x squared divided by x. Now before you venture into any cancelling exercises, because there's some nice x's in the top and bottom line, create factors in both lines. Now since the bottom line is just x, that's a single factor, it's x times 1. If you factorise the top line, take the common factor of x out of both terms, you get x multiplied by something else, 2 plus 5x. Now that the top line and the bottom line are factorised, it's OK to cancel out the common factor. So in that case, the final answer is 2 plus 5x. And that, of course, is an expression that for any value of x, any sensible value of x, will lead to exactly the same answer as the more complicated expression, the fraction, that we started with. And always a good idea, as we saw in the first screencast, to specify the situations where x values are actually illegal. If you're presented with 2 plus 5x, then there's no problem about using any value of x at all in that expression. Unfortunately, it's derived from the original expression, which is the fraction 2x plus 5x squared all divided by x. And we know that x equals 0 is not an allowable value for that expression. So we need to make that clear at the end of our simplification exercise since that information is now hidden from us. So have a look at uh, these three statements. Pause the screencast for a moment and then see if you've got them right. OK, here are the correct answers. If you'd like to find out more about our services, including our drop-in sessions, workshops, and study survival guides, visit www.studysmarter.uwa.edu.au or find us on Facebook and Twitter.